one of the most terrifying elements of psychoanalytic thinking. It's very tightly allied with religious thinking, which is that you are not the master of your own house. There are spirits that dwell in you, within you, meaning you have a will and you can exercise a certain amount of conscious control over your being, but there are all sorts of things that occur within you that seem to be beyond your capacity to control. Your dreams, for example, that's a really good example, or your impulses, for example, you, you might think of those as so foreign from you that they're not even, you don't even want them to be part of you. But, but more subtly even, how about what you're interested in, what compels you? Like, where does that come from? Exactly. Because you can't, you can't conjure it up of your own accord, you know? So if you're a student and you're taking a difficult course, you might say to yourself, well, I need to sit down and study for three hours. But then you sit down and that isn't what happens. Your attention goes everywhere. And you might say, well, whose attention is it then if it goes everywhere? Because you say it's your attention. It's like, well, if it's your attention, maybe you'd be able to control it, but you can't. And so then you might think, well, Jen, just exactly what the hell is controlling it? And you might say, well, it's random. It's the, well, it better not be random. I can tell you that. That's, that happens to some degree in schizophrenia. There's an element of randomness in that. It's not random. It's driven by the action of, of phenomena that I think are best considered as something like sub-personalities, although even that's only a partial description. You can't make yourself interested in something. Interest manifests itself and grips you. That's a whole different thing. And so what is it that's gripping you? And, and how do you conceptualize that? Is that a divine power? Well, it's divine as far as you're concerned because it grips you and you can't do anything about it. And so there's a calling in you towards what you're compelled by and what you're interested in. And sometimes that might be very dark and sometimes not. But you're compelled forward by your interest. And so, and so the idea that what moves you away from your country and your father's house and the comforts of your childhood home is, is something that's beyond you and that you listen to and hearken to. That's exactly right. And you can say, well, I don't want to call that God. It's like, it doesn't matter what you call it exactly. It doesn't matter to what it is, what it's called. It still is. And if you don't listen to it, that's the other thing. If you don't listen to it, and I've been a clinician and talked to enough people now, as old as I am, to know this absolutely. If you do not listen to that thing that beckons you forward, you will pay for it like you cannot possibly imagine. You'll have everything that's terrible about life in your life and nothing about it that's good. And worse, you'll know that it was your fault and that you squandered what you could have had. So, this is not only a calling forth, but a warning unto a land that I will show thee, and, and that's it, that I will show thee. That, and you don't want to be too concrete about this, you know. There's all sorts of new territories that you can inhabit. If you, there's, there's abstract and conceptual territories. If you go to university and you study biology or you study physics or, or any discipline, you're in a territory, right? You're in the territory that all the scholars have established. And then as you master the discipline, you move out beyond the established territory into the unknown. And, and that's a new land, right? Maybe it's even a land of your enemies for that matter. But it's a new land. The frontier is always in front of you. And so, you know, when the earth was less inhabited than it is now, the frontier was the psychological frontier and the geographical frontier was the same thing and now they've separated to some degree because there's not so much geographical frontier but there's the frontier is a place that never disappears and the land that's beyond the land that you know is always there and it's always where you should go and all of that's packed into these what four phrases so well so when i've been thinking about narrative you look at the world through a story you can't you can't help it and, this, the story is what gives value to the world, or, or the story is what you extract from the value of the world. You can look at it either way. You're somewhere, and it's not good enough. Right? That's the eternal human predicament. Wherever you are isn't good enough. And to some degree, that's actually a good thing, because if it was good enough, well, there's nothing for you to do. So it's actually maybe a good thing that it's insufficient. And that might be why sometimes having less is, is better than having more. And, and I don't want to be a Pollyanna about that. I mean, I know that there's deprivation that can reach to the point where it's no, where it's completely counterproductive. But it isn't always the case that starting with little is 
you, if you start with little, you start with more possibility. It's something like that. So you move from always from what's unbearable about the present to some better future, right? And if you don't have that, then you have no, you have nothing but threat and a negative emotion. You have no positive emotion because the positive emotion is generated in the conception of the better future and then the evidence that you generate yourself that you're moving towards it. That's where the positive and fulfilling meaning of life comes. So you want to set up this structure properly. It's very, very important. And so what it means is that you want to be going somewhere that's good enough so that the going is worth the while. And you can ask yourself that. And that's partly what we tried to build into the future authoring program, which is, well, we know what's wrong with life. It's rife with suffering and insufficiency and deception and evil. It's all of that, obviously. Okay, what would make the journey worthwhile? Well, you can ask yourself that. It's like, all right, in order to bear up under this load, what is it that I would need to be striving to attain? And if you ask yourself that, that's to knock and, and the door will open. That's what that means. If you ask yourself that, then you will find an answer and you'll think, you'll shrink away from it. You'll think, well, there's no way I could do that. It's like, well, you don't know what you could do. You don't know what's possible. And you're not as much as you could be. And so... God only knows what you could what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. And that's the reason Abraham is constantly making sacrifices. It's archaic, right? He's burning up like baby lambs, but like, well, they're alive. You know, that's something. And, and they're valuable and that's something. It's You have to admit, even if you think about it as a modern person, that the act of sacrificing something might have some dramatic compulsion to it. You know, to go out into a flock and to take something that's newborn and to cut its throat and to bleed it and to burn it might be a way of indicating to yourself that you're actually serious about something. And it isn't so obvious that we have rituals of seriousness like that now. And so it's not so obvious that we're actually serious about anything. And so maybe that's not such a good thing. And so maybe we shouldn't be thinking that these people were so archaic and primitive and superstitious. It's possible that they knew something that we don't. And certainly in the Abrahamic stories, one of the things that maintains Abraham's covenant with God is his continual willingness to sacrifice. It's so that sacrificial issue is so important because you are not committed to something unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Commitment and sacrifice are the same thing. And I think it's, it borders on miraculous that those concepts are embedded into this narrative at the level of dramatic action. You know, instead of abstract explanation, people are acting this out. And, and, the, and the fundamental conception is so profound that it's really quite, it's quite awe-inspiring. It's, it's breathtaking, really, when you understand what message is trying to be conveyed. You have to make sacrifices. And what do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you.